Zizek appeal, appeals much more to the radical. To, but the radical, a particular type of radical, I, I, I think they're very, the, the typical kind of um, nihilist radical that exists today, but he combines it with, you know, so you've got two types of nihilists. You've got the one type of nihilist that is attracted to identity politics. And Zizek's uh, nihilism, I think, is much more of a, um, I don't know, transnationalist, uh, uh, anti-capitalist, viscerally anti-capitalist, but without, without really the, the, the kind of postmodern element added onto it that exists, that exists in, uh, in, in so much of the left today. And I, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but it's, he definitely, he definitely got, he definitely is, um, you know, he definitely is, an, you know, for smashing the system. And he's definitely for smashing the system without presenting what he views as an alternative. He's vaguely for some kind of form of democracy, but he rejects and is skeptical about democracy often. He's generally anti-state, so he's generally for some kind of uh, internationalism, not globalism. He's very against globalism, free trade. He's much more for... He's much more for a, um, you know, a, a, a UN, a, a, a European Union that's even stronger and more powerful than it is today. For example, he talks about the, the migration crisis, which he blames on, he says it was caused by the West, so the West owes it to these people because they caused the, the crisis in Syria. The crisis in Syria would have never happened unless the West, so... He, he has that kind of neo-colonialism. All the problems in the world were caused by colonialism. All the problems of the world are caused by the West. So the West's job is to help all these struggling places around the world because we caused them to struggle, which is so ahistorical because what exactly were these places before the West even got involved with them? They were some kind of Ottoman paradise in the Middle East before the, you know, uh, uh, the West got involved maybe post-World War I. I mean, it's complete nonsense and complete garbage. But it feeds off of this, you know, and in this sense, he's very similar to the academic left. It, it feeds off of this notion that everything, everything is the, is the West's fault because everything is capitalism's fault. Right? He calls himself, he is, by the way, he's a, I should say something about who he is. He's a philosopher. He's a professor at the Institute of Sociology and Philosophy at the University of Lub uh, Lub uh, Lubidia, something like that, yeah, yeah, whatever, um, uh, in Slovenia, one of the few countries in Europe I have not been to, so in Slovenia, uh, he is, um, he is, he's, he's, he has several doctorates in, uh, in a number, I think it's psychology and philosophy. Uh, he is also, uh, the international director of the Beerbeck Institute of the Humanities at the University of London. So the guy's got a massive, if you will, uh, a massive reputation, uh, international reputation. And again, it's followed by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, and is respected to this important intellectual. Now, I've listened to a lot of his stuff, and... At the end of the day, he doesn't say much. He calls himself a Christian atheist, and, and he gets into all kinds of weird theological discussions, which are, which are interesting, and, but, but at the end of the day, add up to not very much. Um, he, again, talks about democracy as if he supports it, but then he says he's not really supporting it because he doesn't really believe in the wisdom of the masses. Uh, he is... He is a Hegelian. He says explicitly he's a Hegelian. He calls himself an old Platonist. Uh, he is a continental philosopher. So he, he aligns up with the Plato, Kant, um, uh, German Romantic philosophies, continental philosophy. In a sense, the rejection, the rejection of reason. He never talks about reason. That's one thing. And and in that sense, he, you know, Jordan Peterson rarely talks about reason. But but Zizek never talks about reason. 
uh, and uh, really everything that comes out of him is this mishmash of of it sounds mystical but of course he claims not to be a mystic he uh, despises Buddhism because he says Buddhism what did he I mean he had some interesting things to actually to say about Buddhism um, you know he says Buddhism is just a superficial way to justify you know Western consumerism uh, he's, uh, he says it's what, what the Westerners who feel guilty about consumerism kind of latch onto and they study Buddhism in order to, 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 to justify them continuing to live their consumerist life. Um, he, he, he's very critical of modern society. He's very critical of modern values. And in that sense, I think, again, he's very appealing. Uh, he, he talks about in, in the modern world, people are afraid of falling in love. F they're afraid of love. Uh, they're much more comfortable with, uh, you know, instant gratification of, of sex and one night stands, and they're, and they're much more. It's much more difficult for them to actually engage in a in a, a, a fully immersive experience uh, of love, and and that's interesting. And then he has a, a, a completely distorted, completely Marxist, but completely zero sum view of capitalism, and at the same time, and this is. I guess he is a Hegelian because he embraces contradictions. At the same time, he says, and he said this, he says capitalism has, has improved the lives of more people than any other human system. It, it is fantastic at creating, um, creating economic wealth. There is no system like it at creating economic wealth. But then he says capitalism is basically driven by envy. He says, he says capitalism is not the system of egoism. Uh, or egotism, as he says it, he says capitalism is a system and envy, and and you know, so so the the striving to improve oneself is just uh, driven by envy, not driven by actual self fulfillment. Um, he's anti materialist. He's anti consumerism. He, he's just like in, in that sense, he's like Marx. Marx believed that capitalism was the best system for creating material goods. He just any and indeed I talked about this last time when I talked about the debate Marx believed that you reach a point where inevitably that will turn that will turn into the the workers will rebel and uh, a new you know uh, uh, um, dictatorship of the proletarian will emerge in which we will go to the next stage beyond capitalism which will be even more materially successful and that ultimately will dissolve into some kind of utopia where there is no totalitarianism. There's just people doing their thing uh, completely free, uh, I, I guess, from one another, expressing themselves. I mean, it's, it's very vague as to what, and it's certainly vague how these things actually happen. It's completely, I mean, Marxism is completely mystical in that sense. It leaves us up to kind of a, a general positive sense of, how all this evolves and how it all happens. And Zizek exploits that. Zizek is very mystical in that sense. I mean, one of the things that I find interesting about both Zizek and, and, um, and Jordan Peterson is they go on long, long rants that, where they say pretty much nothing. It sounds profound, but it's nothing. Or, or if it is, I don't understand it in my sense from looking at people who are listening to them and the glaze they get in their eyes is that the people, nobody, nobody understands them. Of course, you can't say you don't understand them because if you say you don't understand them, that means that you're an idiot, right? Because they're smart, right? I, I, always, I always, if you watch Man Shapiro and, and uh, Jordan Peterson, a, a lot of times Jordan Peterson will ramble on about something and Ben Shapiro will nod as if he understands. And it's clear he doesn't understand a word. The, and the questions he asks afterwards are also indicative of the fact that he doesn't understand a word Jordan's saying. But you can't say, what did you just say? It's meaningless. You can't say that because then you seem stupid. So people play along with them. I think, I think, uh, um, I think Dave Rubin does the same thing. I think, I, you know, I would do, what would I say? I, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I mean, maybe I would in a debate. But it's, it's, that's exactly what happens is they're, they're complete, it's completely floating. It's completely unconnected. It's completely, it's complete gibberish because it's unconnected to reality. That's the sense in which they are they're divorced from reality, divorced from logic, divorced from reason. And it, when you divorce yourself from reason, then anything goes. You can just ramble. It's magic thinking. 
it's 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 completely it's, it's completely mystical and you can say whatever you want to say and vaguely alludes to things and 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 once in a while, you say something. I mean, you have to say stuff that's interesting. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So, so you spend a significant amount of time saying something that's interesting, and then you go into these rants where it's completely unintelligible, but people go, oh, well, he was interesting before him. This must be good. Like with Zizek, when he analyzes movies, it's quite interesting. So here's the profound thing he said about Atlas Shrugged, which I thought was really interesting. I can't remember fully... The, I, I can't remember now because I saw it a f couple of days ago and anything I see, anything where two days pass, I can't remember. But I can't remember the context, right, that he says this in. So he's obviously not pro Ayn Rand, but he, but, he, but he sees this, obviously he's read Atlas Shrugged, and he sees something in, in Atlas Shrugged that I think very few people who claim to be fans of Ayn Rand see. What he says is that in Atlas Shrugged, John Galt's enemy, John Galt's opposition, the, pe the person most preventing John Galt from achieving his goal are not the statists. It's not the government. It's not Alan Boyle. It's not the leftists. It's Dagny Taggart. It's the woman he loves most. Because it's her actions which makes everybody, everybody, everything else possible. It's her actions that prevent, that prevent the entire society from collapsing, which is Galt's goal, right? Oh, now I remember the context. I'll give you the context in a minute. It's kind of funny. So... It's Dagny that's holding, that's, that's preventing civilizational collapse. It's Dagny that is preventing the achievement of Galt's goal, right? Yeah, the spoiler alert, sorry guys. It's not who you would think the bad guys are, right? Now, she's not bad in the same sense, right? She's not evil. She's not, but she's wrong. And her actions are what he needs to thwart. He needs to destroy her in order to achieve his goal or convince her. There's no, nothing else. He either needs to convince her or destroy her. Now, that's absolutely true. That's exactly what happens in Atlas Shrugged. That's right, he, uh, Muhammad Ali tells me, he said this is a New York Public Library appearance, that's right, that's where I saw it. And the context is, yeah, I, 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 Enric says Dagny is Atlas, and Atlas has to shrug for goal to achieve his goals, Atlas has to shrug, or Atlas needs to be destroyed. So, Gold doesn't spend any time trying to destroy Owen Boyle, but he spends lots of trime, time trying to destroy Taggart Transcontinental, Dagny's company, to destroy her company. That's his only way to, to succeed. Now, for Zizek to get that, I give him a lot of credit. Now, how does this translate in his mind to his struggles, right? He wants to see civilization collapse, and, and we will get to that in a minute. He wants civilization to collapse. And he sees as his enemies those who sustain civilization. And they include academic left. They include much of the political left, particularly the political left that is trying to moderate capitalism. He wants to see it crushed. He wants to see it disappear. He wants to see it go away. And he views as his enemy the, the kind of traditional leftists or even the communists who want some kind of communist utopia, which he thinks is a complete disaster and that, you know, and he's hugely critical 
of, uh, of uh, the Soviet Union, although, and again, this is, this is his, he, he calls himself a, a, a Leninist sometimes. And when you walk into his house, when you walk into his apartment in Slovenia, the first thing you see is a picture of Stalin on the wall. And when asked why there's a picture of Stalin, he says, I put it up there on the wall so that stupid people like you ask that question. Basically, that's what he says, right? He, he, he says he rejects Stalin elsewhere, but I think what he admires at the end of Stal with Stalin is that Stalin was willing to smash things. I think he doesn't deny that the end was a disaster. He doesn't deny that the end was failure. But I think what he admires about Lenin and what he admires about Stalin is their willingness to destroy, their willingness to kill, their willingness to smash. And again, that's a sense in which he is a nihilist. Now, let me just cover, is he a communist? I mean, not the way, right, oh, uh, actually, Greg Sommier says he wrote a whole article on Ayn Rand years ago. I, that, that's interesting. That would be an interesting, uh, that would be an interesting read uh, because he's obviously not an idiot. Um, and again, it, his observation about, about Dagny and, and Galt is, is interesting, uh, is, is correct, you know, where, where a lot of people get it incorrect. And at least I haven't seen him um, in his videos criticize Ayn Rand, although I'm sure he does. And I, I, it would be interesting whether he strawmans her in the same way as so many intellectuals of the left today straw man him. So he strikes me as not being a communist in any kind of conventional sense. He's not striving towards a kind of communist state. I mean, first, uh, to the extent that he's a communist, he's an internationalist, uh, in a sense that I think he probably believes that communism can only come about if it's international, if it's global. Uh, but he's he's also not willing to project what that future utopia looks like. He's not willing to say, he was not willing to follow Marx's line in terms of what is going to happen. What does utopia, what is the vision for utopia? He's not, and he's certainly not willing to say, right? He's not willing to say that there's some kind of inevitable historical process, as Marx says, he actually rejects that idea. What he does say is this system the way it is today is a disaster. And then he goes from there to, I'm a pessimist. I think the world is going to end. And, and here he constantly comes back to this theme. It's unavoidable. There's just no out. And I think part of the reason he's a pessimist, and I think he's a metaphysical pessimist, part of the reason I think he's a pessimist is because I don't think he can see a utopia. I think he's too cynical about human beings. He's not like Marx who believes we can kind of evolve into this being that just is in this Marxist utopia. I think Zizek is cynical about human beings and what they are and what they're capable of and what they can and cannot do, right? And therefore, he can envision this future. And then on the other hand, he completely buys into the ecological, he calls it ecology, which is interesting. He's an old line in that sense. And what his, 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 his discussion of environmentalism is very interesting. I, I want to get to that in a second. He talks about... Um, the, you know, the big threats to the world, which are going to be ecological, um, you know, uh, uh, nature. And he thinks the biggest threat to the world is, uh, you know, the ability, uh, uh, the, the, the first genetic engineering and then the ability for us to implant chips in people's brains, kind of the, the, the development of technology is going to destroy the world. But let me, let me say something about his view on environmentalism because I think it's interesting. Um, he says the problem with the environmentalist movement is that it glorifies nature. He says, no, nature's brutal. Nature's horrible. 
nature is 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 is, a, is you know attacks man it's it's almost impossible for us to live in nature it, mother mother nature is not there's no benevolent mother mother earth out there right? nature in and of itself is incredibly dangerous and and human beings you know human beings spend their life or, or, or spend their existence trying to change nature to fit themselves in that sense you know it, it I agree with him right and it, it's it's you know we're not we're not we shouldn't glorify nature in and of itself you know so he says that he's an ecologist but without illusions but he says on the other hand right we need nature in order to survive as human beings. So in that sense, he's human-centric. He's not. He does not see the intrinsic value of nature. So he's much more sophisticated. He's much more sophisticated than, than the, the, the common environmentalists out there. He does not see the intrinsic. He says, we need a certain balance in nature. Not balance, because he rejects the idea of balance. We need nature in order to survive. We need... I don't know, oxygen, we need water, we need these things. And he says it's inevitable because we're such crummy beings and because of the incentives capitalism provides us, we are going to destroy nature and therefore we're going to commit suicide. We're going to destroy ourselves. So he, he sees whether it's, global, whether it's climate change or whether it's something else, he sees us destroying the natural infrastructure human beings need in order to survive, and he can't imagine us solving those problems because of his cynical view of man and because of his cynical view of capitalism. Second, he, he, he worries about our ability to genetically engineer. He worries in particular about our ability to combine computer with mankind and therefore to have the authoritarians be able to control our minds. He's generally, generally very, very worried about authoritarianism while still mildly, seemingly admiring Lenin and Stalin because he worries about control. He worries about absolute control. He worries right now about China because what really scares him about China is the combination of authoritarianism and capitalism because he admits that capitalism creates the goods and yet China's managed to create the goods and be authoritarian at the same time and that's a very scary combination the the, the good thing about the Soviet Union is their authoritarianism destroyed their capacity to create the goods and therefore they were poor and therefore they were destroyed what destroys China what brings down this new form of authoritarianism now, I think all of that is a lack of understanding of what's really going on in China, which is that it is the absence of authoritarianism in particular realms of life which creates the space for capitalist innovation and capitalist creativity and wealth creation to occur, entrepreneurship. And as the authoritarian state in China tries to do social scoring and tries to regulate every aspect of human life, as it becomes more totalitarian again, as it was under communism, under Mao, that ability to create wealth will go away. That is, the wealth creation in China was created in the spaces left free of authoritarianism that the Chinese government allowed to exist. And that's one of the differences between China, post-Mao China, before Mao China, and, and, the, and the Soviet Union, is the Soviet Union did not allow those spaces to exist. Mao did not allow those spaces to exist. Quite the contrary, they crushed those spaces. They destroyed those spaces. They did not allow any form of individual freedom to exist. That, that is not what happened in China over the last 40 years. Now, it, so certainly from 1978 on. Now, it's true that over the last few years, authoritarianism is being reinstituted in China. But slowly, cautiously, because they realize they're playing a dangerous game. And we will see what its ultimate outcome is, but already you're seeing significant reductions in economic growth in China. 
And, and I think it's a direct consequence of the increased authoritarianism in China. So I think it's Zizek's complete lack of understanding what capitalism is, complete lack of understanding of how capitalism functions that, uh, that causes this. The other interesting thing about Zizek, and here he, he's, 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 I think he's more of a Marxist than he will acknowledge, is Zizek is not interested like Jordan. Jordan is interested in some degree in individual um, uh, redemption, in, in individual success, in, in individual being able to be successful in some aspect of their life. Zizek rejects that. Very, Zizek reviews everything as social. So in, even in the debate with, uh, with Peterson, Peterson was talking about you know, individual actualization or whatever, um, and Zizek says, well, but you can't actualize yourself in the kind of society we live in. What matters is the social context. It's all about society. So in a sense, Zizek excuses any individual problem you might have as caused purely by these social issues. And until you solve the social issues, individual redemption or individual success or individual happiness is impossible. So he is amazingly pessimistic, which, which fits, I think, the, um, I think fits the attitude of young people today. Uh, the world is going to end, and they love that. And, and he, he's not offering a utopia to replace it. What he's offering is to embrace the fact that the world is going to end and, and relish it and hope that what happens on the other side of it is somehow better than what we have today. And it almost, according to him, has to be better than what we have today because what we have today is awful. Awful, both spiritually and um, in a sense materially because we are so materialistic. We're so consumer driven. We're so obsessed with our work. He never uses the kind of Marxist term alienation, though. Oh, I haven't, never is, I shouldn't say never, because there's thousands of hours of him online, and I've only listened to some. Anyway, so I think he appeals to the pessimism of young people today. He also appeals to this idea that it's not about fixing yourself. It's about fixing the world. And... You know, that's an interesting question, right? I mean, there's, there's, what is more important to a young person? Fixing themselves or fixing the world, right? Now, as objectivists, we would say the only way to fix the world is to fix yourself first, right? You have to first. But what interests people who are young? I mean, what interests young people, you know, 16 to 25? What interests them more? Self-help? Happiness, being good people or, or achieving self-fulfillment in some way, or fixing the world. And we're talking about, I'm talking here about people who are intellectually active, people who are questioning and looking and seeking and, and, and being out there, right? I'm not talking about the ones who just want to get a job or the ones who just want to get an engineer or who want to understand the world and, you know, just be engineers or something. Um, and it's an interesting debate because it's actually a debate that, that is going on, I think, within objectivism. It's what appeal would work more with young people? Uh, this is how objectivism can help you be happy or this is how objectivism can fix the world. Right. Now, in a sense, Jordan Peterson is appealing to this is how philosophy can in a sense, make you a better person. He's not using the happiness word, but make you a better person. I think Zizek is much more appealing to this is how my ideas can help fix the world or at least uh, change the world, to destroy the world, which is horrible, which he said destroying is fixing, is better, bettering. And I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting question where, the, the, where there's a bigger desire. I mean, I happen to be on, in, in the in the camp that believes that young people are primarily focused out there and less introspective. 
and the primary focus is wanting to, I mean, again, young people who are active. Now, maybe that's a self-selecting already bias. Um, they want to go out and fix the world. They're upset about injustices out there in the world or perceived injustice. And they understand uh, they're, they're quite politically oriented, politically active. So you've got to offer them. So, you know, if I do a talk, and maybe it's just because it's me, but if I do a talk on here's how to be, here's how to find purpose in life or meaning in life, or if I try to do what Jordan Peterson does, or if I do a talk on here's the evils of socialism, the one on socialism will get a lot more views than the one on trying to better yourself. Now, I don't know what, you know, which appeal appeals to more people. I, I just don't know. I, you know, I, I, it just seems to me, from what I've seen, is the appeal, the appeal to changing the world is bigger than the appeal to changing yourself. Because, you know, when, when do people start buying self-help books? When do people get engaged in the process of self-help? Of, of buying all those books, of attending seminars, of figuring out how to achieve happiness. It's usually later in life. It's not people in their 20s. It's usually in their 30s or 40s. It's usually kind of a pre or during midlife crisis type of phenomena. I don't think self-help books sell for 20-year-olds. I think they sell for much older people. Um, I think that realization that we should be more conscious of what we're doing, who we are, and how we can shape our own consciousness, our own lives, in the world in which we live in today, um, that comes later. I think the first thing young people want to do is they want to shape the world out there. And, and the idea that they can shape their own world the, 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 the way they should engage with themselves and therefore with the world, that's, that's tough for them. That's difficult for them. It's difficult. So it strikes me that self help. Anyway, I'm rambling now. I'm doing as uh, I'm doing a uh, what I criticized others for doing. Um, uh, all right. So it, that to me is is Zizek. I mean, I, there's tons to talk about. I mean, one of the things I talked about this earlier. One of the things that he shares with Jordan is the lack of clarity, um, and of course there were all kinds of issues about the specifics, how he holds specific issues in politics. Um, his criticisms of Trump and, and, and his criticisms of the European, of, of Europe and nationalism and populism and all of that. And, and some of those I agree with him on. Uh, some of them are complete nonsense. Um, I think it's an, another interesting character out there in an intellectual space. And what's interesting is how do we appeal? How do we go? How do we appeal to the kind of people who Zizek and Peterson appeal to? Or, of course, those are different people people Zizek appeals to and the people. Although I think there's some overlap there. More than maybe either one of them would like to admit. And in the debate you saw that there was a lot of commonality. Okay, I'm getting a lot of super chat questions and I'm falling Can behind. I, with my friend them. take over. You go to Gulag.